There are a few false doctrines more dangerous than the Calvinistic assertion of eternal security or once saved, always saved. This belief has become pervasive far beyond the reaches of theological academia and once saved, always saved is a popular mantra for the average low information Christian. It crosses denominational lines, bleeds between theological spectrums, and slips into everyday dogmas. The doctrine of eternal security essentially states that once a person is saved, nothing can cause them to be disfellowshipped from God. Without going too deep, it should be noted that there are numerous variations and machinations of this doctrine. In its most extreme form, a person could theoretically be saved and go on to murder his wife while remaining unconditionally saved. Others would assert that if someone were to commit such a heinous act, he was never truly saved in the first place. Sadly, this perilous doctrine flatly contradicts scripture and it is commonly used as a smokescreen to justify sinful lifestyles. In other words, once saved, always saved appeals to the most carnal leanings of our humanity. It gives false legitimacy for sin, false comfort to sinners, and builds a pseudo-biblical barrier between countless sinners and repentance. It's eerie how the Calvinistic notion of eternal security shares similarities with Satan's seduction of Eve in the Garden of Eden. The serpent assured Eve, ye shall not surely die. The satanic implication being that Eve could live in disobedience without fear of divine consequences. The doctrine of eternal security makes the same false claim and it originates from the same satanic source. Here's the primary passage of scripture used to prop up the concept of once saved, always saved. According to the book of Romans chapter 8 verses 35 to 39, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Savior. First of all, this is a tremendously encouraging passage of scripture, but it's talking about God's unconditional love, not unconditional salvation. With close examination, you'll find that sin is not once mentioned in the context of this promise. As with other passages used to support once saved, always saved, the emphasis is always on eternal forces having no authority over your personal responsibilities towards God. Let's put it this way. Nothing can force you to separate yourself from God except you. Satan can't make you do it any more than he made Eve do it. Eve exercised her free will. Adam exercised his free will. And they both suffered the consequences of their actions. Death. Furthermore, sin separates us from a right relationship with God, but it does not remove us from the love of God. For example, the book of Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Clearly, God loves us even while we are in sin. But to say that the cross made sin acceptable is to completely undermine the necessity of the cross in the first place. 
The phrasing, while we were yet sinners, shows Paul's assumption that believers would naturally understand sinful lifestyles must be discarded after salvation. Furthermore, the Apostle Peter calls us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, who did no sin, in 1 Peter 2, 21-22. A few verses down in verses 24 and 25, he underscores that Jesus bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls." But we still haven't sufficiently debunked the doctrine of eternal security. Few people would argue against the scriptural emphasis on living above sin. Many would argue that righteous living is the best way, but not a requirement for heaven after obedience to the gospel. So let's take a look at several scriptures that prove that it is possible to throw away our own salvation and trample upon the grace of God. The parable of the sower gives us insight into the issue at hand. Jesus speaks of individuals who receive the gospel immediately with joy. But when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, they fell away. Consider these self-explanatory scriptures from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 through 6 says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Hebrews 10 Verses 26 and 27. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. <coughs> and Hebrews chapter 10 verses 38 and 39 says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Additionally, Peter speaks plainly in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20-22 through 22, of people who return and are overcome by the pollutions of the world, stating that it would be better if they had never known the way of righteousness in the first place. But the words of Jesus are the most potent in Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Brothers and sisters, we can go on and on demonstrating the scriptural imperative that we must not depart from the faith post-salvation or risk divine judgment. Saved individuals must continue to work out salvation with fear and trembling. I'll give you a list of 10 that can happen if we don't stay in the word of God and know the truth for ourselves. Children of God can one Fall from grace, says Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 and 13. 2. Be led away with error, says 2 Peter 3, 17. 3. Err from the truth, says James 5, 19 through 20. 4. That a weak brother may perish, according to 1 Corinthians 8, 11. 5. Fall into condemnation, says James 5, 12. 6. Be moved away from the hope, says Colossians 1, 21 through 23. 7. Deny the Lord who bought them, says 2 Peter 2, 1. 8. Depart from the living God, says Hebrews 3, 12. 9. Can be a castaway, says 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. And 10. Can become accursed children, says 2 Peter 2, 14.
Three, these scriptures make it absolutely clear that we can lose our salvation. We can't say, you know, I got saved 30 years ago and continue to drink that alcohol. We can't say we got saved 35 years ago and continue fornicating. That's absurd. Sin cannot and will not be in the kingdom of God. The Bible makes that clear. If you say that you are saved and continue to live in sin, Jesus will say to you, depart from me, I never knew you. Jesus is coming soon, friends. Don't be a foolish virgin. Come to Christ and live in his ways and statutes. This is John Tinsley with Everlasting Rock Ministries. And always remember, the truth never fails. God bless you all.